Uh, you are 0.4% Ashkenazi Jewish. How can a religion appear in your DNA results? Think about it. When a testing company tells you that you're 2% Jewish, what exactly does that mean? Christianity doesn't leave a genetic trace. Neither does Buddhism or Islam. Yet Jewish ancestry shows up clearly, generation after generation, across continents. Why? Because unlike any other faith, the Jewish story is also a genetic story, one shaped by exile, bottlenecks, forbidden marriages, and survival against impossible odds. To be Jewish is something that I'm very proud of. To uncover this mystery, we need to go back nearly 3,000 years to the hills of ancient Canaan, where Israelites first emerged. At the start, they were not genetically unique. They were one of many Semitic peoples of the Middle East. But history changed everything. Wars, exiles, and centuries of endogamy, marrying within the community, began to carve a distinct genetic footprint. Today, scientists can trace that footprint across Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, identifying Jewish ancestry with a precision unmatched by almost any other population. This isn't about religion altering DNA. Faith doesn't do that. It's about how culture, geography, and survival strategies sculpted one of the rarest and most resilient genetic signatures in human history. By the end of this story, you'll see how ancient migrations, forgotten empires, and even devastating diseases left marks still detectable in living families today. And before we dive deeper into this hidden chapter of human history, make sure to subscribe to Stone and Bone. Because here, we unravel the secrets your school textbooks never told you. To understand why Jewish ancestry shows up so clearly in DNA tests, we need to return to the cradle of their story, the ancient Levant. Around 1200 BC, Egyptian records mention a group called the Israelites. According to biblical tradition, their ancestors traced back even further to Abraham, who is said to have lived around 1800 BC in Mesopotamia before migrating to Canaan, roughly modern-day Israel and Palestine. Genetically, these early Israelites were not distinct. They were part of the larger family of Semitic-speaking peoples in the region, close cousins of Canaanites, Phoenicians, and Arameans. An ancient DNA backs this up. A 2017 study on Bronze Age Canaanite remains found that modern Jewish and Lebanese populations derive over 90% of their ancestry from these same Bronze Age peoples. In other words, the roots of Jewish DNA lie deep in the soil of the Levant. But genetics wasn't the first marker of difference. Culture was. These early Israelites began practicing monotheism, a radical departure from their neighbors. And when the Babylonian conquest in 586 BC exiled much of Judah's population, something critical happened. The scribe Ezra urged the exiles not to intermarry with surrounding peoples. This early boundary, marrying within the community, became the foundation of Jewish genetic distinctiveness. From this point forward, exile became a recurring theme. After the Persians allowed some Jews to return, many still remained scattered. Then came Alexander the Great's conquests in the 4th century BC, which spread Hellenistic culture and further dispersed Jewish communities into Egypt, Syria, and Greece. The real turning point came in 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the Second Temple in Jerusalem after a brutal revolt. Tens of thousands of Jews were expelled. This is when the diaspora truly accelerated, scattering Jewish families from North Africa to the edges of Europe. And here's the remarkable part. Even though they lived side by side with Greeks, Romans, and Egyptians, Jewish communities largely maintained religious and cultural boundaries. Marriage usually stayed within the faith, though conversions and some intermarriage occurred. This consistent endogamy left a genetic signature strong enough to survive centuries. Modern studies confirm this. More than 70% of Jewish paternal lineages across Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and Mizrahi Jews still trace back to the Levant. 
That means despite 2,000 years of exile and dispersal, a shared core of ancestry connects Jewish populations in Iraq, Morocco, Poland, and Yemen back to the same ancient Middle Eastern origins. Think about it. If you uncovered through a DNA test that you carried a hidden ancestry, one that tied you to an ancient people scattered across continents, would you embrace it or struggle to believe it? Share your thoughts in the comments. I want to know how you'd face that discovery. As centuries passed, the Jewish diaspora crystallized into three main branches, each with its own history and genetic fingerprint. Mizrahi Jews, these communities never left the Middle East or North Africa. Iraqi, Iranian, and Yemeni Jews lived continuously in the region, preserving some of the strongest genetic continuity with ancient Israelites. For example, Yemeni Jews remained isolated for nearly 2,000 years, creating a community that shows approximately 85 to 90% Middle Eastern ancestry with minor Arabian admixture. Their DNA is like a time capsule of the ancient Levant. Sephardic Jews In the Iberian Peninsula, Jews settled in Spain and Portugal, flourishing for centuries under both Christian and Muslim rule. Genetic studies show Sephardic Jews carried a blend of Middle Eastern, North African Berber, and Southern European ancestry. But in 1492, they were brutally expelled from Spain. Many fled to the Ottoman Empire, Italy, and North Africa, taking with them this unique genetic mix. Even today, Sephardic DNA carries the signature of both Levantine origins and Iberian history. Ashkenazi Jews I believe that my entire family is Ashkenazi Jew. Okay. The most genetically studied group began forming around 900 to 1000 AD in the Rhine Valley of Germany and France, later spreading eastward into Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. Their story is shaped by founder events and bottlenecks. Geneticists estimate that today's Ashkenazi population descends from just 300 to 400 individuals who lived around a millennium ago. Here's the twist. While Ashkenazi Y chromosomes are overwhelmingly Middle Eastern, mitochondrial DNA shows something different. About 80% of maternal lineages trace back to just four European women who likely converted and joined the early community. This blending of Levantine paternal lines and European maternal lines created one of the most distinctive genetic signatures on Earth. As Jewish communities spread across Europe, they faced centuries of pressure. The Crusades brought massacres. Entire towns of Jews were wiped out. In medieval cities, Jews were often expelled, only to resettle elsewhere, again and again. Each expulsion meant fewer families carrying the genetic torch forward. Then came the Black Death in the 14th century. While plague devastated all of Europe, Jewish communities faced an even darker fate. False accusations of poisoning wells triggered massacres that slaughtered tens of thousands. The survivors were confined to ghettos, with little freedom to marry outside the faith. These brutal restrictions further shrank their gene pool. Geneticists call these events population bottlenecks. In plain terms, when a small group survives while many perish, their DNA becomes overrepresented in future generations. Studies suggest that by the late Middle Ages, the entire Ashkenazi population could have dwindled to just a few thousand individuals. And yet, from those survivors came explosive growth. By 1500, the Ashkenazi numbered perhaps 10,000. By 1900, they had surged to around 5 million. That dramatic rebound left behind one of the strongest examples of genetic bottleneck effects in all of human history. But bottlenecks come at a cost. When a small group repopulates, rare mutations can become common. For Ashkenazi Jews, this meant unusually high frequencies of certain inherited diseases. Take Tay-Sachs disease, a devastating neurological disorder. Among Ashkenazi Jews, about 1 in 30 people carries the mutation. In the general population, it's closer to 1 in 300. Goucher disease, Bloom syndrome, and Canavan disease follow similar patterns. Sephardic Jews, too, carry distinct risks, like familial Mediterranean fever. Persian Jews show elevated rates of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And it doesn't stop there. 
mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes linked to breast and ovarian cancer are up to 10 times more common among Ashkenazi women than in the wider population. What began as survival bottlenecks centuries ago now echoes in modern hospitals and genetic counseling sessions. Ironically, these very medical risks also made Jewish genetics easier to identify. Early geneticists used these founder mutations as reference markers, and later DNA testing companies built on those data sets. So when a consumer DNA test tells you Jewish ancestry detected, it's not religion in your blood. It's a cluster of inherited markers that trace back to small, resilient communities who survived against the odds. To be Jewish is something that I'm very proud of. The Jewish story isn't only European or Middle Eastern. Scattered across the world are communities whose genetic profiles reveal fascinating twists in the tapestry. Take the Beta Israel of Ethiopia. For centuries, they practiced Judaism in near isolation. Their traditions included Sabbath observance, dietary laws, and Torah-like texts. But genetically, their ancestry is about 95% Ethiopian, with only faint signals of ancient Middle Eastern input. Most scholars believe their origins trace to local conversions influenced by Jewish traders from Yemen or Egypt over 2,000 years ago. In India, the Bine Israel community lived for more than 1,000 years along the Konkan coast. DNA analysis shows they are predominantly Indian, with a small fraction of Middle Eastern ancestry, evidence that perhaps a small group of Jewish migrants intermarried with locals, blending genetics but preserving religion. And then there are the Kaifeng Jews of China. Founded by Persian merchants along the Silk Road during the Song Dynasty, they intermarried over centuries until their DNA became indistinguishable from their Han Chinese neighbors. Yet, they clung to Jewish rituals, keeping kosher, practicing circumcision, and reading Hebrew prayers until the 19th century. Their story shows that Jewish identity was never only about genes. It was about faith, culture, and resilience. Let me ask you this. Do you think religion and identity are stronger when preserved by bloodlines or when they survive purely through culture? Share your thoughts in the comments. I'm curious which you believe matters more. One of the most persistent and controversial claims about Jewish genetics is the Khazar hypothesis. It argues that Ashkenazi Jews didn't descend from ancient Israelites at all, but from a medieval Turkic kingdom called the Khazars. The story goes that in the 8th century, the Khazar elite converted to Judaism, and their descendants became the bulk of Europe's Jewish population. This idea gained fame through Arthur Kistler's 1976 book, The Thirteenth Tribe, and has since been used by conspiracy theorists to undermine Jewish connections to the Middle East. But genetics paints a very different picture. A landmark 2010 study led by Doran Behar, along with many subsequent genome-wide analyses, found that Ashkenazi Jews cluster tightly with Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, and all of them share strong genetic ties to the Levant. No significant Central Asian ancestry shows up that would support a Khazar origin. At most, a small trace, less than 5%, might exist, but the overwhelming evidence links Ashkenazi Jews back to ancient Middle Eastern populations, not the steppes of Central Asia. So, while the Khazar hypothesis remains a favorite of internet forums, science has decisively debunked it. For decades, Jewish genetic history was reconstructed only through modern DNA. But now, ancient DNA technology is rewriting the story with direct evidence. In 2020, scientists analyzed remains from Iron Age burials in Jerusalem. The results showed unmistakable genetic continuity between those individuals and modern Jewish populations, as well as neighboring Levantine groups like Druze and Samaritans. This isn't theory, it's physical proof that a genetic thread stretches more than 2,500 years from the ancient Israelites to modern Jews. Other projects have studied Judean desert remains and skeletons from the Second Temple period. Again, the pattern holds. Despite thousands of years of conquests and migrations, the genetic backbone of Jewish identity persists. What's remarkable is not isolation, but survival.
Genetic Continuity Alongside Layers of Cultural Adaptation The story of Jewish genetics isn't just ancient. It's still unfolding today. Around the world, people take DNA tests only to discover hidden ancestry they never suspected. In Spain and Latin America, families with no outward Jewish identity sometimes learn they descend from conversos. Jews forced to convert during the Inquisition, who secretly passed traditions down for centuries. In Mexico, historians estimate that up to 20% of colonial settlers carried converso roots. In Brazil and the American Southwest, families are rediscovering old customs, like lighting candles on Friday nights, without realizing they were echoes of a Jewish past. Even in South India, the Bina Israel story is being revived by DNA, proving that what survived wasn't only tradition, but also genetics. These rediscoveries are reshaping modern identity. Reminding people that Jewish history is not a single thread, but a vast tapestry woven across continents. So when a DNA test flags Jewish ancestry, it isn't detecting faith or belief. It's detecting the legacy of migrations, bottlenecks, and resilience stretching back to the hills of ancient Canaan. From the four European women who helped shape Ashkenazi maternal lines, to Ethiopian and Indian communities, preserving Jewish rituals against the odds. The Jewish genetic story is one of the most unique on earth. It's a story where biology and culture refuse to be separated, where exile never erased identity, and where memory survived not only in texts and prayers, but in the very code of life itself. If this journey fascinated you, don't forget to like this video. Share it with someone who loves history and subscribe to Stone and Bone. Because here, we uncover the hidden chapters of humanity written in blood, stone, and time.